Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we have a new interview with an amazing woman. She has a master's degree in philosophy and um, she is a basketball player. She's a human rights, a human rights activist and she's also a volunteer in many, many different initiatives and many different, different campaigns. Has been uh, working for years and uh, especially in the past couple of weeks. She was showing her solidarity for Palestine and the Palestinians. Today we have Rebecca O'Keefe. Let's start with um, a small introduction about Rebecca. Um, you have like a, a lot of like career history, I would say. Um, so maybe we can start first with uh, like how did you get into the sports? Um, you you played basketball and you played with the highest league. So how did that start in, in your life? Yeah, I would have played basketball since I was about maybe nine, ten years old. My family was all into basketball. It was very much a family day out would be going to basketball. So grew up playing it, always played it. Would have played a lot of sports. We were very big into sports in my family. So anything going, I would have played. I, I don't know what it's like to not play sports, basically. And then came to an age where I suppose would have had to choose which sport to play. So basketball it was. And yeah, I would have played internationally from a young age. and continued that throughout and progressed on then to, to playing Super League, which is the highest league, um, right. and playing college and, right. and all that. But then I would have uh, actually taken a break, I quit <laughs> right. uh, for right. like seven years and then came back playing um, two years ago, yeah. back Super yeah. League. Um, so yeah, and we actually got to the National Cup final last year. Um, so it's always been part of my life and sports has been a huge part of that. And I just think, I mean, the, the lessons you learn from sport carry into your, your daily life and the values it teaches you, the discipline, commitment, right. sportsmanship, I mean, fairness. I think, yeah, it really stands to you and especially, you know, personally, professionally. So, yeah, I mean, I love sports. Right. <laughs> I love sports. Yeah. Yeah. But then at the same time, it also kind of opens your eyes to being a woman in sport and the unfairness and inequality there and yeah it there's a long way to go <laughs> right right and um like it's like a, a long history i can i can see and um was it challenging from the beginning until you quit and then you you went back again so was there challenges in the middle yes <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like. so, so how, yeah. what, what was the biggest challenge i would say like which one was like I cannot forget that challenge because yeah. you know, which one was like the worst? You know what, playing high level sports, you, you make sacrifices. Right. But, but you, you do that willingly because you're, you're there for the sport, the love of the sport, the, the success of it comes, but also a lot of failures. So you, you take that, but I did, I mean, I, I suppose I was playing at high level, I was sacrificing a lot. There was some success, a lot of failures, but then. Um, Internationally, I suppose, there was a number of years where there were no international teams. They were actually pulled for financial reasons, right. financial mismanagement, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there were no, no teams. So we were playing, I was playing college, I was playing club, I was playing the highest level, but there was kind of that limit, limit. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was nowhere more to, to progress to, so I uh, suppose that generation of us kind of did lose out. But that wouldn't be the reason totally to quit. So I did actually have like some health issues, right. and then I was I finished college, and I suppose then you think about work, career, because basketball's not professional here. So you do you do have to work. You do you have to have a job. You have to have a job. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and then I, I suppose work took over. I went living abroad, and it was only because of COVID where I came back from abroad, started living here again. Again, my, my family is very involved in basketball, so my, my, my parents were still coaching and I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get back involved, I'm going to get myself fit, right. try to keep right. up with these young ones. Right. Um, right. But yeah, and I suppose, like, you also have a lot of friends there, like, there's a community, I love community, and the basketball community, sporting communities, that's where you form your friends, you spend a lot of time with these people, and you, you do want that, that camaraderie again, and so yeah, I went back playing, and yeah, I, I did miss it. So it was nice to go back into the fold. And but then again, I suppose I am now at a, a different stage to a lot of people. They've been quite young, and again, you have to have your career or your your personal life. And at what stage do you say, oh, well, I can't right. go out. I can't go to that wedding. I can't, I have to miss all these things. I can't travel. Yeah. I can't do this. 
because I'm training. Your social life is completely changed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then even, even professionally as well, like a lot of things I would have to turn down or weigh up like what's because when I commit, I, I commit. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not one to miss training or and especially at the high level, you really you have to turn up, you have to put the work in, you have to put the dedication in. You don't right. let your teammates down either. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, again, like those those lessons stay with you. Right, and are you still in contact with some of the people that you played with uh, years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah everyone so very small community, as I said, we also play. Now, I also play game football and movie, and like I, I do have a few different sports, well, so I just play that as well. Right. But yeah, the, the friendships you make in sport, you, you always have them. Right. So yeah, so it's centered to them, and I did take a break this year, so I stopped playing this year right. to go play game football and movie. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, at that point, can't do it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and I'm yeah. still in touch with them, still, you know, cheer them on, still follow them all. Right. Yeah. And uh, being involved in the, in the sports community um, in, in Ireland, um, we've seen, like, a lot of uh, athletes um, who do share their support with Palestinians and uh, with Palestine, with the cause, um, who ask for ceasefire, who ask for justice. Um, so, being in that community and you yourself, you're you're like you're sharing the, the same um, like need for justice for Palestine and the Palestinians. And then um, I think uh, also the community started a campaign on social media, especially on Instagram, called uh, Irish Sports for Palestine. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Like where did this come from? Like um, especially that um, you have history of uh, international peace. Right, yeah. in your master's degree. So, master's degree. Yeah, so tell us about what you're studying and how did that impact on the current situation in Palestine? Yeah, I suppose um, to answer for it, like when I did take a break from sports yeah. and I was traveling and I was doing work and I guess seeing a lot of things really it informs your worldview and it informs mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, coming back. It's how, how, like marrying those worlds, I suppose, because you can't separate, you can't separate them at all. And so our sport of Palestine started from a number of very high-profile sports people who mm -hmm. just said we can't stand idly by while genocide is happening. Do you know? And it's like people of those that stature taking such a stand and, and speaking out is really impactful, and it, it, it sends a strong message of solidarity and, and community, and we're upholding all these values. So a number of them started it and they had an open letter which was calling on governing bodies such as FIFA, the IOC, FIBA, all these governing bodies to suspend Israel from international sport, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to look into, investigate how they're um, violating all these charters, these sporting charters. I mean even FIFA has in their, in their charter that we promote equal Rights. We promote human rights. A lot of them would say, you know, sport is promoting peace, it's promoting all these values. But how are you going to stand for that and have, you know, all these. And, and also, they've acted before. There's precedent here. They, they have removed Russia and Belarus from international right. competition. Right. They, they've done this before. So why is it different for Israel? Why is there inconsistency? Why is there hypocrisy? Why is there a double standard? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the Irish Sport of Palestine really now has a, has a big presence um, mm -hmm. because a lot of people are speaking out. Over 400 athletes from a range of different sports have now signed this letter which was presented to the Minister for Sport. And they go marching and yeah, so they're really getting involved. And how I became involved in them was, so basketball, Ireland was the women's senior women's team was due to play Israel yeah. last November. Right. And when I heard this news, um, I, I, I just couldn't believe that this was happening. And also, why have these national or governing bodies like FIBA, who is the governing body mm -hmm. for basketball, mm -hmm. why have they not removed Israel like they did with Russia? So back right. in October, I actually called on FIBA mm -hmm. and Basketball Ireland. So mm -hmm. I said, Basketball Ireland, withdraw your participation and tell FIBA to suspend them. And I said to FIBA, you should suspend them. So it turned out that the match was postponed. Ireland Not so postponed. Not, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I said to yeah. yeah. Okay, so then uh, it was postponed to February 2024. And 
Ireland requested a neutral venue because it was supposed to be in Israel. So January, they, January of this year, 2024, they released a statement to say, we will be fulfilling this fixture. And I reiterated my, reiterated my calls and I said, we should postpone, or no, sorry, we should boycott, yeah. which our participation, suspend Israel from international competition. And what, what was their answer? Like what, when you tried to, you and probably like a lot of other people, yeah. what was, what, what yeah, did they so, give you as an answer? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so I raised these calls and then it started getting traction because the likes of IPSC, Irish Sport for Palestine, and then even Teachers for Palestine, right. like all these solidarity groups then right. said, well absolutely we should boycott it, no one should be crossing the international picket line. And I believe by engaging with and competing against Israel, we are complicit in supporting the atrocities. That's my belief. And I think a sports boycott of this fixture would have sent a strong message of solidarity to Palestine, but also a condemnation of Israel's violent group. So a lot of people got behind it. There was an, we started an email campaign. I contacted uh, Basketball Ireland, FIBA, the Ministers for Sport. So many people on numerous occasions got no response. IPSC got no response. And then event, like, it picked up a lot of traction mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of social media and media, mainstream media as well. And then eventually they came out with a statement to say, we are fulfilling the fixture because it would be ruinous, there would be bans and fines and etc. etc. But I, I thought that it was overstated a bit in the media because at the first forfeit, which this match would have been, there would have been no ban. Mm -hmm. The first forfeit would have been a fine of up to 80,000 euro, which we all would have crowdfunded for. Because basketball, you, ha you have to understand as well, basketball is it's under-resourced. It's not one of the, the big main sports. While we have a lot of people participating in it, it's, it's still seen as to be quite small and under-resourced. So, I was like, well, we, we can cry from this, you know, uh, so there's a lot of people who would support this initiative. And, and what, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but what the people like supporting of, yeah, even if there was a fine, we do support that if you don't go for that, and we could, was it like, let's say, the people around, the Irish people, the Irish public, do they, did they actually support that idea? I think a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people then said, well, gosh, like, they might be banned for a number of years, it could ruin sport, but I think that's what people latched on to, even though it wasn't correct. Right. And so it wasn't until the second fixture that it, there could have been a ban. But we were only calling for this fixture to be boycotted. It could have happened from the beginning without a ban. Yes. And okay. then a lot can happen between then. We could have international pressure, we could have got the governing bodies removed. Like a lot could have happened where we could have just reassessed them. So this one, I was like, it's, it's only a fine that we could help you with. But that got lost in, in, in amongst it all. So a lot of people did support it. I mean, at this, it, it definitely grew, it definitely grew, the support grew, and then I suppose the, the organisations just did not take decisive action. And I, throughout it all, I always said the players should never be in this position. I really felt for the players. And that's actually really interesting because as a player, like, you're torn between, yeah. because you, you're a player yourself and you do understand the feeling. How do you think the, 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 the women who played the game, how do you think they felt? Because I, I don't think like it's their decision. Um, somehow it's not their decision because it needs to be coming from the, the, the management, it's coming from the organization who is in charge. So how do you think they felt about it? Mm, yeah, first and foremost it should have come from FIBA. Right. And then it should also come from Basquiat. Because I, there were so many precedents where they did the same thing for Russia and Belarus. They mm -hmm. removed Russia, but then Basket Ireland also said, we're not going to play against Belarus. Mm -hmm. So they've done it before, so there was precedent, so why are you not doing it now? So you could have acted and taken decisive leadership. It fell to the individual players, which I totally disagree with, and I can only imagine. But then we have to remember, five, if not six, individual players boycotted that match. Right. And like, huge respect to them. That was so brave, such courage. And I like they should definitely be applauded for that and taking that moral stand. Should never have been on them. The players who did go, again, should not have been in the position. I don't judge them for going. But they what they went to play the game and then like, I can't even imagine it must have been so stressful. And then the week leading up to it, we saw images emerging of the Israel basketball team posing with machine guns, there was guns on the court, there was political messaging, there was it was Honestly, I've never seen it. It was on. I've 
It should have alarmed everyone. And we've never seen such a thing no, before. No. We I'm have never seen that. Um, and even with, with, the, with the Russia Ukraine, we've never seen that. We've never seen like this level. No. Uh, the pictures that we see. It's crazy. And but I think that, that goes back to just Israel weaponizing this propaganda. And it's a propaganda machine. And it's also Israel acts with impunity. So no matter what they do, they get away with it. Right. And I think that example was very clear that they just get away with everything. Now, if FEMA has said it's under review and they're, they're going to look at it and will they sanction them? Because Israel flagrantly violated so many rules with those actions. Are they going to sanction them? Who knows? But that's like a really good example, a really good microcosm for what's happening on the international political stage. Israel acts with impunity, international law violated, nothing. 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 And then every time they act with impunity, they weaken international law and they set new precedents. It can happen there, it can happen everywhere. So what we saw this week was disgusting with their actions. Then they decided to, one player actually um, falsely accused Ireland of being quite anti-Semitic. So those comments, are false. Right. But also that's right. like so predictable. It's, it's Israel's go-to, you're being anti-Semitic. We need to understand that like, the difference between anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, and the conflation of religion with this is so dangerous because then it leads to more hate and targeting of other faiths. I think because this is appalling, the most documented genocide, because we are now seeing in real time, we're seeing all of this happen in front of us, we're seeing through a lot of the propaganda. I think the mask is falling from Israel's propaganda. I think people are now seeing and understanding <laughs> I, I do think if there is a shift in public opinion, definitely. I think before, I was like, oh, we can't be accused of anti-Semitism, not knowing fully that it's not anti-Semitic, it's anti-Zionist, mm -hmm. and there's a difference. So I think now we are finally coming around to it. But So when they accuse Ireland of being anti-Semitic, then Basque Ireland said, okay, we're going to take the stand, we're not going to partake in pre-match arrangements, including exchanging gifts and shaking hands. So they, they did not do that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they, they did a stand, but to me that was in response to being called anti-Semitic, and whereas we were calling for a boycott in response to the genocide. And I don't know if that was reported, maybe, because it received international attention. Right, it, right. It, it did. It Even Al Jazeera, they both said that. I know, a lot of them, they said, okay, wow, amazing, they didn't shake the hands, but okay. But also, where was the stand against genocide, and where was the the five players that did boycott the game? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we kind of have to take it in context as well. Yeah. Um, but now, like, why we did cough boycott the game? I suppose it received a firstly national attention. The whole week, people were talking about it, mainstream were talking about it, and basketball doesn't really get that much attention generally. So everyone's talking about it, and then afterwards, now internationally. So it's definitely sparked this conversation, and I think that's really. I guess when we're calling for boycotts and, and non-violent resistance and I suppose how are we measuring success or was it a failure because they didn't boycott the game but we have to look at what it did do and it sparked a conversation. People are now talking about it. We're now looking at possible, possibly like international coalitions tapping into other countries or organisations who have called for boycotts of similar sporting fixtures. So definitely something happened. And now again, I do have to reiterate like the players should never put in that position. I can't believe the games went ahead based on that. Like, there were so many opportunities to pull out, notwithstanding the boycott calls, but like even the safety, like any of this. So I, oh, I just, the, I feel for the players. It should have never been on them. Right. And I, I suppose as well, we, we had called out to even ministers and, and governing bodies, and I suppose the lack of action was pretty evident. The, the double standards is evident. And where do we go from here? Um, so the second fixture is set to be November 2024 in Dublin. Right. And if nothing changes between now and then, I mean a lot of change, but if nothing changes, I would still be advocating for a boycott of that fixture. We're going for a boycott of the next fixture because yeah. technically that will still count as the first forfeit. So this game was played, that will still be the first forfeit. There will be no ban. It will still be an up to 80,000 euro fine. Okay, okay. no, yes. there is no way. Because they played this fixture, this would be the first fourth. So it's worth emphasizing that obviously a lot will happen. 
I would say like you're, you're calling for boycott, um, especially in the sports context. Does boycott work? And this question, I'm not talking about, um, I don't want to talk about statistics and numbers. I want to talk about, as a normal person, as a person right now, I'm doing some kind of sports or I'm, I'm, I'm just doing my daily routine. Mm -hmm. Is boycott actually something that has impact on me? So yeah, so in terms of it, do boycotts work? Yes, I believe they do. You only need to look now at, and I'm sporting aside, if we take McDonald's, Starbucks, all these organisations are now reporting a decline in sales because we're boycotting. And I guess a lot of people focus on well they don't work or why is sports the one to suffer, it's not on the athletes or the clubs. Or, I get that, but these are not taken in isolation. And if you take them in isolation, and again, it goes back to how we're measuring success. So, BDS campaign, boycott, divest, divest and sanctions have been around for over 25 years, and it's a very targeted campaign of boycotting and divest and sanctions. And it's a, it's a whole approach, it's not just one thing. It's not one thing in isolation. So if we take a whole strategy, they are effective. I think as well, if we're talking about do boycotts work? Well, what again? What is the success? What is the end goal? If it sparks a conversation, if it sparks attention, if it sparks more action down the line, that to me is worth it. Right. And I think we, when we talk about activism and we're talking about doing these huge things, or you know, or if people say, "Oh, it won't matter. I'm only one person. Doesn't make a difference." I really dislike when people say that because. How about we flip it? Yes, I am one person, but look at all the tools I have at my disposal and what can I do to, to make a change in my little corner? What can I do? And when we, when we take a moral stand or boycott or you know, promote isolation or sanctions, it's in, it's in the whole strategy. And I think, for, as, as you were saying before, um, if you just stop taking a cup of coffee, if you, you know, little changes do add up. Right. And I really believe that like, drop by drop, little by little, no action is too small. And if you can make a tiny bit of difference anywhere you can, we should be doing it, especially when it's moral, especially in the face of oppression. Because I think, especially if we think, I should, oh, I'm only one person, it won't make a difference. The minute we start reverting to that or descending into, you know, cynicism, nihilism, pessimism, what's the point? Their tools will be oppressive. So we need to counteract that with more hope, right. with more action, with more love, community, kindness, care. And I think the more we do that in any type of way, we can make a difference. And boycotting one game won't stop a genocide. But the point is to apply pressure. So we're asking these organisations governing bodies, politicians, to not only reflect what public opinion are saying, to act in our interests, we're also putting pressure on them to act. So that by putting them under pressure, they're more likely to do it. And that's one way we can do it. So it's about putting pressure. It's about holding these people in institutions and organizations to account. We need accountability. We need leadership. We, we need you to reflect public opinion. We need you to stop genocide, because if, you, if you're not standing up to that, what hope does humanity have? You know, I, I, I'm honestly at a loss, and I think this is, yes, I'm a sports person, but my career as well as um, in the field of peace, trying to reconcile them, like, I, I love sports, I don't want to stop sports, I don't want to like, penalise athletes or clubs or anything, but at what point do you say, I can't stay quiet, I have to use my voice, I have to do something in my power. And that is something you can do to put pressure on these people. And I think, yeah, I, 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 I'm at a loss really because I can't believe we're still here, I can't believe we're talking about this, I can't believe the inaction. I honestly, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know what to say other than that. And I, it really, again, trying not to descend into hopelessness. I'm trying to keep hope. And I think activism relies on hope. Hope propels activism. And hope is in seeing little actions, seeing little changes. As you say, like little by little, small wins or small stands, the micro rebellions or the everyday, the everyday resistance of what can we do. And it all adds up.
and we have to clean it back up. Right, right. And, 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 and you, you are involved with the sporting community, you are also have your friends, you travel a lot, um, you have friends probably from all around the country, um, you have your family, you have your friends, and the official stand of the Irish government, does that represent what the public wants or what the public is asking for? Um, because even before the ICD ruling, they did not join the South Africa case, and even after the ICD ruling, and um, after that, even though they said that we're gonna consider, there was no like official stand against the genocide. Does that represent the public? Right. No. And you, because I'm asking you, because you are involved in many communities, not only like one group. Yeah. So that doesn't represent. No. And I think even. The fact that we have people on the streets every week, week in, week out, more and more numbers, more and more people voicing their dissent, more and more people wanting to hold these politicians to account and reflect public opinion. And it's, it's interesting as well because Ireland has such a long history of solidarity past when giving our own history and context. And while Ireland is probably one of the world leaders in solidarity past, historically so, and has been quite strong sometimes. We feel like we're not being represented right now. The fact that you haven't supported the ICJ case, the fact that you don't hold a stronger position on all of these. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, we continue to fund our funding, but I mean, why? Like, that's the bare minimum. Why are we applauding the bare minimum? Yeah, as you said, so now that the ICJ ruling is a real plausible genocide, countries are now on notice that you have, you have a duty to prevent genocide. So are those politicians doing everything in their power to do that? I don't believe so. Yeah, we need to hold these politicians to account and make them act in a way that reflects public opinion. And I mean, we're even seeing now, I mean, all, when we operate in these global systems, oppressive systems, I mean, all, all struggles for freedom, for justice, for rights, for equality, they're all linked. And if you're not acting, to do that in a genocide. We cannot guarantee you to act that way. Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is why people say, what, okay, why is why Palestine? Why, why are you an activist for Palestine? And just because we talk about this doesn't mean we're not an activist for other conflicts and other yeah. systems of oppression or system um, fights for equality. But Palestine, I think, is humanity's litmus test. Because not only is it going on for Oh, decades, 75 years. We are now witnessing the most documented genocide. The experts have said it's the, the deadliest rate of death and destruction of the 21st century. And if you're not acting to try to prevent that... We've never seen anything We've never seen anything like it. More than that, yeah. We've and never it, yeah, seen Yeah, we've never seen it. And if they can get away with it, as I said, if you can get away with it there, it right. can happen anywhere. And we, have, we are seeing it happen in other places. And if, if, and it just it also shows that these so-called world leaders or these multilateral associations, the UN, the Security Council, the time for change. Right. Like, right. Correct. Something has to give. I mean, the you're not, yeah. Uh, th th this action lead me to uh, uh, a little bit of like a general question about sport mm. and politics. They don't mix with it. So you have masters in peace, and uh, you're. Um, you studied this, and then you also from the sport community. So, is this correct that sport and politics don't mix? I mean, okay. people say sports and politics should mix, but I think when they're saying that, it, it, they're really just saying sports and selective politics don't mix because sports and politics have been interfering always. And I think when we say sports and politics don't mix, sometimes it's like an, a lazy out or it's like. Yeah, it, it just excuses a lot of things and um, gives people a reason not to act politically or act in a certain way because if you think about it, there's been so many precedents where sports and politics have mixed. For example, the most recent being removing Russia and Belarus from international competition. There's also been, you know, if we, it just highlights an hypocrisy and inconsistency and double standard with these sporting bodies and that they only act when it's in their interests. I mean, there's huge problems with sport washing. And sports washing is so pervasive in sports, but people don't want to 
don't want to deal with it. And when you talk about sports and politics don't mix, well, okay, take the professional professional sports. Are you so does US soccer women's team, for example? I think a couple of years ago or last year got equal pay. Are you saying that that's not political? That's not allowed. So there are moments when politics, and then it also goes that I mean, being a woman in sport, it's political. Right. Because everything, every decision that's made is political. Who are you funding? How much are you funding? Who are you getting the money from? What are you deciding to invest in? How many, you know, what are you... It's not based on sport, it's based, based on sport. politics. And then All these decisions. Yeah, and if you're not investing in sports, and then you're expecting them to produce the same revenue, but then you're saying, well, we're not going to broadcast it, and then it's down to broadcasters, down to advertising. There's so many things and layers, even down to regulations, uniforms, rules, a lot of it. I mean, a lot of women in sport, I used to play in like men's gear for a lot of the time. Mm. How could we say sports and politics don't mix? It has to, because otherwise, how are we going to get equality? Discrimination is going to still continue on. It's going to replicate, you know, misogyny, homophobia, racism, the amount of oppressive structures that exist within sport and we just say sports and politics don't mix and it's an easy out i don't accept it and nor should anyone else and i think when we hold these again hold them to account you know there's so many examples of sports and politics mixing there's so many examples of boycotts and sports working i don't think like it, it just shows that you, you can't you can't use that as an argument and then we saw, particularly, I suppose, in, in US uh, sporting landscape around 2010, 2020, the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. We saw a lot more athletes becoming athlete activists. And I'm not saying the owners should be of athletes to lead these movements by any means. It shouldn't. But when they take a stand, or when they speak out, or when they use their platform, it's hugely impactful. And there's so many examples of, of athletes making political stands, right. despite, you know, Regulation saying you can't be political, but you know, that's selectivity. Because we're not sure what's up wrong with you, man. Like, this person is playing football, playing basketball, playing tennis, whatever. Yeah. They're human beings, they feel, they have family, yeah. they have friends. And, and if they were in a position where there is a, a war zone in their country, like, you would feel bad for them. That's why they feel bad for, for other people. That, that's why they show their solidarity for other people, even yeah. though I am. Uh, I'm from the sport community, but it's not like I'm a human being. Yeah. And, and also, when you put on a jersey, or you, especially for your country, that represents something. And I think sports is actually a good avenue. Sports is such a good tool to promote so many different things. Right. Peace, fair play, level playing fields, camaraderie. Like, there's so many good things about sport. But it's also, we can't lie, it is an avenue for soft diplomacy, right. for pol pol politics. Mm -hmm. There's definitely, you know, agendas going on, and we can't ignore that. And yeah, showing solidarity or showing condemnation exists in sport. And I think as well, like with sport for Palestine, Irish sport for Palestine, it just shows as well as athletes or sports people. Again, using the values that sport teaches you, we are now espousing them in day-to-day -day life. We're now living to our sporting values. We're, we're demonstrating that. Right. And we're also showing solidarity. We're showing, you know, others, not just sports people, but other humans that your lives matter too. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're with you. We're showing right. solidarity and, right. you know, we're showing. So, so, yeah. so it, exactly, like you, can, you cannot represent fair play and, and justice in sport with, with having uh, some government having a, an apartheid in, in, a, in a country. That these two things don't mix because. That is the exact definition of double standards because you you represent values in one field and then you get rid of these values in the other field. Yeah. Um, and you also like talked about uh, being a woman in the in the in the sports community and the sports field. Um, you are an, an a, a feminist and activist for that, and you are an author. You wrote a book about uh, uh, feminism. Yeah. Uh, would you like tell us a little bit about um, where did this idea come from? and what is the, the, the book actually talks about in details? Sure, yeah, so I'm an activist, but I'm an author and researcher, and right. after completing my master's in international peace, I came in touch with a woman, um, Dr. Lina Abarafa, who's my co-author. She's an amazing, amazing woman, absolute 
sports. I, I learned so much from her and I can't say enough good things about her. But so she was actually updating her book on Afghanistan at the time and the, the gendered implications of aid at the time of US withdrawal and she needed an editor, a contributor, researcher to come in very last minute. So I said, yeah, never met her. <laughs> I said, yeah, right. we'll work on it. And it was right, it was right in my, my feet, my passion, okay? So right. I'm with, with gender and, and peace. And so we worked on that. And after that, it started you know, a working relationship where we collaborated on many different things. She's a gender expert, a humanitarian aid worker, and she's based in New York. So how this book came about was she, she was also um, executive director of the Arab Institute for Women in Lebanon, which is a regional um, uh, centre. And it started as a curiosity, I suppose, and I, um, based on her, her work and especially young people coming into her, young feminists. And it started from curiosity of, okay, well, what are these feminist movements? What are they agitating against? What are they fighting for? And so she sent me a message, you know, hey, I have this crazy idea. Right. <laughs> so I'm in. So initially she had said, hey, why don't we do 50 year look at feminist movements in the Arab region? And then we kind of got to talking and, and because of my activist background as well, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in, you know, creative activism. How can we do activism that's not necessarily on the streets? How are we doing it in our day-to-day -day lives, in other avenues such as sport, art, music, right. fashion, all of these different avenues the online, which we're now seeing online mobilization has right. been huge right. in the region of Palestine. And so it, it kind of just went from there. So we, we decided to take a regional view, regional approach, and interview and do a survey and talk to young feminists who are, you know, because especially in the Arab region, there's this huge backlash against women's rights, just against fundamental freedom, freedoms. So many different front lines for women that are not necessarily traditional mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. you know, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and it's not unique to the region by any means. Patriarchy is everywhere and these, these problems are not unique. But the Arab region tends to perform the lowest, if not amongst the lowest, in a lot of these international essays on gender equality, of political representation, economic empowerment, education, so many facets of life that does not just eat, does not equal rights. And, and you actually, like, uh, uh, you travel in, in multiple Arab countries and you live there and you meet the people there, you, you, you are introducing the culture over there. So I, I think, like, you got a really, really great background about what's going on. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that must help you a lot about uh, yeah. doing the research yeah. and then contributing in the book. Yeah, so I would have spent probably a decade in and out of the region through working, living, traveling. And I think, yeah, it's important to say, especially for me, that I, I'm acutely aware of my position in this as someone not from the region. And that's something that I interrogate all the time. This is not my story. But yeah, I want to amplify these voices. I want to, you know, I, I want to amplify the voices and give them space. This is their story, not for me at all. But then at the same time, I'm a woman. And having experienced a lot of things in the region, out of the region, as a woman, right. it is still personal. And so that's where I kind of approach it from. It was a curiosity, but it was also, because, okay, so like one in three women in the world have experienced violence. That's a fact, probably understated because lack of data or reporting. But also the f violence, if we expand our notions of violence, the fear of violence, every woman has experienced. Mm -hmm. And that fear of violence is universal. And when you, you can empathize with that and you can, you can see what, obviously I, I will never understand or comprehend a lot of the context that these women are facing. I get that. But again, struggles against oppression are connected. And I think that's why we kind of took this regional approach that while contexts differ, a lot of the times struggles against the patriarchy are very similar. And is there a way that we can make this network or connect these struggles in order to right. dismantle right. the patriarchy right. or the oppressive right. system? So yeah, right. I am very aware of my position in this and the top priority was centering their voices. It was the only priority. Right, right. And I'm very privileged that they shared with me. Right. Very heavy, but I'm very privileged that they shared with me. And 
that is something I don't take lightly. I also really, really understand that their safety is at risk. A lot of times it's not safe for them to speak out, to do anything, even sometimes being public against or like fighting for their, their rights is a very radical thing to do. So yeah, it was. And look at all of this. At some point, there is no guarantee of safety if, if yeah. you try to speak in public or if you try yeah. to publish one story. So you you, you yeah. must have been like really careful about. I'm taking this story, but maybe I'm you not, cannot I'm mention any names yeah, or yeah. specific details. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, 100 percent. Right. And their protection was always right. front and center. So yeah, we took this kind of long view to understand historically, but then we took a broad view regionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We kind of clustered into the different, like the Levant, the North Africa and the Gulf. And then we kind of looked at creative ways of activism. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they have, the region has one of the most active feminist movements. It's incredible and it's inspiring and especially the youth movements. And it's like an unapologetic, we are not getting our full human rights. What can we do to get them? And so we, we looked at the different creative um, ways, but then also, how can we how, how can we work to, to help that and, and advance it and what are we missing what what can we do so like if that's mentorships if that's creating a community and network online mobilization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um like re-interrogating masculinities like you know and like right. even just the term feminism or feminist carries a lot of connotations and even engaging with that has to be interrogated so yeah, so that, that was essentially the book, and um, right. yeah, we're now planning more work together. But right. yeah, it, it was um, very interesting. That's right, uh, and, and and I remember also like not until I don't know like how many in, in the sixties maybe or like uh, a little bit before that uh, in the U.S. women were not allowed to have uh, bank accounts. Um, uh, I think it, it was like maybe forties. Uh, I'll have to double check, but it's like still like it's a recent thing. When we're talking about even the twenties or the thirties, like th that, like we have a lot to work on. Uh, we have a lot to work on. So imagine that was only uh, like what hundred years ago, even less than that, and women didn't allow to open a bank account. And okay. then even when they allowed them, they were not allowed to take mortgage. Even when they allowed them, they put some extreme like conditions uh, if if yeah. to get accepted if you're a woman. And then it's like. A struggle over a struggle. So yeah. even sometimes when when uh, and I'm not saying uh, like it, it, it might be different from country to country, but I mean the core thing is the same. Like you keep fighting for basic rights. Yeah. You're not talking about something that uh, uh, requires like uh, something extra or like a privilege. It's like a basic right. Basic right. And let me ask you this: when you actually like publish the book uh, with your uh, how, how was the reaction with the people, friends, and uh, the, the, the people who read the book? How was the reaction? Yeah, so we wrote it a year ago, and then it took a year to come out. And by that stage, a lot of it was, unfortunately, outdated. And especially in the context of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And especially in the context of so many different... You know, it's almost like you take a step back, and then there's, like, major regression. Mm -hmm. And, the, yeah, no, the reception, and people said, this is... A, really necessary conversations that we need to have, definitely. But we also didn't feel like promoting it in any way, given the context of what's happening, and it just didn't feel right. So we haven't done a huge amount of publication mm -hmm. around it, mm -hmm. but we are still hugely proud of it, and hugely proud of the, the conversations we're having, and even the people who were involved in it, the conversations, and even just seeing the movements that they're doing now, and. You know, because you add, as you say, like you're, you're agitating for basic rights, but then you, you add on protracted crises, you add on pandemics, you, you add on conflict, you add on so many different things you, that are in this region, and it makes everything so much harder. And a part of the book was a lot of these people are saying it, it's really hard to fight and grieve at the same time. And that, is, that just sums it up, because you're grieving for so much based on, on the, of the loss, the destruction, the death, the conflict, the, everything else. And yet, how do you still find in yourself to still agitate for rights, to still keep going, to still say, to still have that hope? And it all comes back to hope. And hope is a really hot, like, big theme throughout the book. So everyone I talk to, I always ask, what's your hope for the future? Or do you have hope? Or themes around hope. And 
I mean, a lot of them dance the, the line between hope and hopelessness. And just because we're hopeless now does not mean we're not hopeful for the future. And I think that's active. And like you, you ebb and flow between hope and hopelessness. But at the end of the day, you still need hope that things will happen, that things will get different. And especially in, in times of upheaval or, you know, we go back to the 2011 pro-democracy uprising, the so-called Arab Spring. In the aftermath, they, that transitional period offers so much hope and opportunity that things can get better or things can change. And a lot of women have been active on the front lines and agitating for that change. But then what you see is often these women are just sidelined, neglected, excluded, or told to go back to traditional roles. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of context that, how do you keep agitating for this? How do you keep right. going? And what can we do to expedite yeah. that change? It, it's a, an exercise in hope and sweat at the same time. Right, <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to, uh, to end the interview with that question of, of how can a normal person, mm -hmm. someone who's sitting um, in the house or someone was working or doing sports or, or someone is studying, how can I show solidarity to the Palestinians mm -hmm. in a very, like, I don't, like, you know, I might be afraid to go for, like, really publicly and yeah. talk about really deep politics. How can I do, show my solidarity? What can I do in, in, in a very simple way? Yeah, I think that's really important. That showing solidarity or activism doesn't have to be huge lifestyle changes. It can be really small things that you can do. Mm -hmm. So I, I love community and I always go back to community. And if you have community or you find community, you have support, care, kindness, love, hope, you have all those ingredients in a community. And community action is so powerful. And it, if you can find that community, what are they doing? Get involved. Any, anything, you think the online mobilization has been huge for Palestine. And we've, ne we've never seen anything like it, I don't think. And you think sharing something won't make a difference, it does. It all makes a difference, like no action is too small. So if it is sharing something, if it's just even learning about it, it's okay to say you don't know any, something. Go, learn, ask for help, look for these sources, see what you can do. You can, if you don't want to, like marching is great. Like there's, pres there's power in presence, showing up, checking in on people. A lot of it is just, you know, being that human, that interaction, that connection that people want. So yeah turning up to protest, sending an email, sending a letter to your TD. Anything that you can do, we should be doing. And there's so many resources. I mean, Palestinians have had to, for decades, advocate for this. Right. They right. Listen to them. Most of all, listen to them. Amplify them. Right. Be led by them. What do they need? The, the role of an ally. Use your voice where you can, but never be louder than those indigenous to that. Right. And I, I firmly believe, and we need allies, we need everyone, because right. it will take everyone. So whatever you can do, and like in these small things, don't take that Starbucks coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, That's simple as that. Yeah. For so long, I think a lot of people felt like they couldn't or shouldn't or wouldn't speak out for Palestine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, the activism or speaking up for Palestine could have lost a job or could have, you know, it, was, it right. wasn't like it is now. And it is appalling and abhorrent that it has taken a genocide for it to become an international issue. Horrific. I think humanity has failed on so many levels. And it's for a conversation for a different day. But the fact that it is an international issue means something has to change. Right. It has to be what we hope will change. So yeah, if we keep advocating for this, speak up where you can. because. We have to. We, must, we can't bury your heads in the sand. We're seeing it every day. And your voice matters in this. Right. Have those conversations. It all starts with the little things. Have those conversations with your friends, with your colleagues. Co like, have the conversation. And that's the lies we're told. It's the propaganda. It's right. the anti-Semitic allegations. It's, yeah, it, it, the propaganda. And I do think the mass right. is falling. And people are seeing the difference. And it is disgusting that it's gotten to a genocide. And still, we're having to agitate. Still, we're trying to convince people. And Palestinians have been doing that for decades. It's exhausting for them. Like, you know, and I think as well, like, language is so important in this. Language is important, I know, but language is so important in this. And the dehumanization and the bias and the, the inaccuracies is horrific. And I think. And what, and what is stressing this? Like, how do they 
step by step and slowly keep dehumanizing the Palestinians. So when something like this happened, you don't feel anything. And, and some people literally, because uh, they, they don't feel that this is, this is a genocide. They don't feel like it. Um, and I think that the huge reason is, is because there is a, like a dehumanizing systematic way of the Palestinians. And this is, like, this is happening, yeah. right? In plain and, sight. And the, right. the, the narrative, the, the journalistic bias, the, the language used, right. is the, it doesn't compare. And even like the representation of media is so skewed. And we're fi I, but I hope we're finally waking up to that. But yes, language is so important, and especially right. in the Palestinian context, right. and like, as you said, dehumanization. But name things for what they are. We have evidence. Call it what it is. Call it out. The more you use it, the more it becomes true. So, yeah, the language is important. And I think as well, a lot of people feel now maybe they just turn off the news or they don't want to see it or mm -hmm. they don't want to. Mm -hmm. We don't get that choice. We don't get that option because Palestinians don't. And, and we've seen all the, all the things online. Like, you're sick and tired of seeing it. Well, they're sick of living it and experiencing it. And it's a nightmare. We, we can't even comprehend the trauma of this. We, we cannot. Mm -hmm. We cannot comprehend any of it. Like, immediately, coffee ceases fire, but after that, end occupation, lift to siege, like I said, or colonialization. All of this to come, but end, end cease fire now, but we can't even comprehend past like, this trauma, we can't even comprehend it. it. It's on a different scale, and yeah, I, I, we don't get that luxury. Right. And I know a lot of people in activism say, well, I, a lot in activism, like, there's a lot of you know, burnout, or are you looking after yourself, the self care? It's a, it's a, and the guilt of, well, I can't really switch off because they don't. It's, yeah, it, yeah. yeah it's a hard, it's a fine right. line. Right. But then it's also, well, we do have to mind ourselves to show up for people. And yeah, I don't think, um, well, I certainly have not cracked that yet. Right. <laughs> of, right. Right. of getting that balance right. But it, it is true. And, and it comes back to community and right. connection. And I mean, going to the demos every week. You see that there are other people in this. Mm -hmm. Like isolate you, you're seeing it on your phone. It's, it's isolating. But you go to this and you have thousands community. of people, thousands. thousands, and around the world, millions of millions. people. Like maybe, yeah. Yeah, 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 a lot of people. Um, thank you so much for everything. If there is any anything that you would like to end this interview with, uh, I would be more than happy. That's like the final words from Rebecca. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, just no action is too small, and you. Just do whatever you can and we have to have hope. Thank you so much.